And what franchises are fundamentally about is intellectual property. So I'm going to discuss a little bit about intellectual property and the various types of intellectual property that exist and that are relevant to franchises. Intellectual property generally means property that is not physical. You've got physical property, which is real property, real estate. You've got personal property, which is movable property. And then you've got intellectual property, which is something where you own an idea or you own a process or you own something that may not be able to be held. The three major examples of intellectual property are patents, copyrights, and trademarks. Patents is a process, an invention, something like that. Copyright is a written work or a musical work or something to that effect. Then you've got trademark, which is something that indicates or uh, is, is associated with an organization. You know, the Nike swoosh or the uh, McDonald's M or, you know, the baseball teams, uh, you know, the, the New York Yankees interlocking NY, something like that. Things, things that are recognizable to the public or to the people uh, that, that symbolize a particular product. So a franchisor li licenses the use of the trademarks in the franchise agreement. Anyone who uses the mark without authorization, and that's talking about people who are not franchisees or even that are franchisees but don't have the right to use something under a particular agreement, can be sued for trademark infringement. And the franchisor can recover damages or what is called an injunction, which is a court order for the other person to stop doing this wrongful infringement. In other words, a franchise agreement should say what the person has the right to use. Does the person have the right to use all the company logos? Does the person have the right to use some of the company logos? And exactly to what extent do, do, you, do you have to do that? And then there's something similar to a trademark called a trade secret. A trade secret is something that that is not public knowledge. The classic example here would be the recipe for Coca-Cola. Coca-Cola is almost famous that Coca-Cola has this secret ingredient that they won't tell anybody and blah, blah, blah. But the franchisers, obviously, the, distrib the distribution franchisers, the, sorry, not the distribution, the manufacturing franchisers, the people, the franchisees, the people who are who are uh, bottling and making the new the Coke, obviously, they have to know this ingredient, otherwise they wouldn't be able to, to manufacture it. So what if they go ahead and take this secret ingredient and they disclose it and they, they release it to the public? Well, that is a misappropriation of trade secret and that would subject them to being sued. The franchisor can recover damages and obtain an injunction, again, which is a court order for them to stop doing it if anybody releases any trade secrets. In any franchise agreement, um, you, uh, sorry, in any franchise relationship, first thing you have is a franchise agreement. An agreement is between the franchisor and the franchisee that sets forth the conditions of the franchise. Now, it can cover pretty much anything. If I want to open up a Starbucks, the agreement between Starbucks and I can cover pretty much anything. Usually, it has some sort of a fee that I pay to open up. I pay, you know, a $100,000 one-time fee, and I get certain, maybe I pay a yearly fee also, and in exchange, I get Starbucks intellectual property. It may also contain things like quality control standards, Starbucks doesn't want just anybody to have their <coughs> to have a Starbucks. You know, if the, if uh, if the franchisees do a bad job, well, then the parent company is going to get a bad reputation. If I if I have a bad experience with the uh, you know with the Pizza Hut in, in in Dallas, well, then I might be less likely to go to the Pizza Hut in Houston. So there may be terms in the contract that require a certain level of quality control. Same thing with training requirements, a covenant not to compete. In other words, the idea is if you have a Starbucks franchise, well, then you're not going to go turn around afterwards and open up your own coffee shop and use all the secrets that you learned as a Starbucks owner and therefore compete with other Starbucks. An arbitration clause, which is a very common ca contract clause in general, which says that in the event that there is a dispute, rather than going to court, you will agree to go to arbitration. Use of the franchisor's trade name, logo, and trademark and conditions for termination of the franchise if that happens. They will, the franchisee will typically have to pay a franchise fee. A franchise fee is established in the agreement. This may include an initial license fee to start, a royalty fee, which is a, a fee to use the intellectual property as you move along, assessment fee, cost of supplies, lease fee. These are all different types of fees that a franchisee might have to pay in order to run a, an, an individual franchise. Well, now let's get to the end of a franchise relationship. How can a 
franchise be terminated? Well, it could be terminated for cause, which means for a good reason. It could be terminated at will if the contract allows it to be terminated at will, which means where either side can just end it right away without giving any explanation. And underlying both is the possibility of wrongful termination, which is when one side ends it illegally or against their agreement, and that might cause a lawsuit. Termination for cause means some good reason that the franchisor has for ending the relationship. This could be non-payment of a franchise fee. This could be continued ma failure to meet quality control standards. Really, it could be any violation of the franchise agreement. These are just two very common examples. Then there's termination at will. And even if the agreement between the franchisor and the franchisee gives the franchisor the right to end the relationship at will, many state and federal laws prohibit terminating the franchise at will because you don't want to allow the franchisor to take advantage of the franchisee. If I go and work you know, work very hard to run a, run a wonderful Starbucks in this area for five years, then all of a sudden they shut me down and say, you can't use the Starbucks logo anymore, but thank you so much for giving us all that free advertising and cultivating all these great Starbucks relationships in your town. You know, we're going to open up a Starbucks next door. That's not really fair to me. So there are certainly federal regulations that apply to that. Wrongful termination occurs when there is no just cause for termination. Now, of course, if the contract expires, that's a different story. If the, con if the franchise was only established initially for a 10-year period and 10 years expires, well, then, of course, then, then the, the franchise simply ends. But if the franchise agreement was perpetual and there's no good reason, a franchisor cannot simply cut off the ability of the franchisee to operate. And if, the, if it does happen, if Starbucks shuts down my, rest my coffee shop for no good reason, then I can recover damages based on this wrongful termination and by suing. In terms of the relationship between the franchisor and the franchisee, the franchisee is an independent contractor, which means that the independent, the franchisee is not an employee or an agent and is not liable for the and the franchisor is not liable for the franchisee's contracts and torts. If I am a franchisee and I own a Starbucks in New York, let's say, first of all, they don't pay me a salary. I earn my own salary. I may pay franchise fees, but the point is they don't have to send me a W-2 or any kind of tax form because I make my own money and I pay my own income taxes. I'm not an agent of Starbucks. I can I'm an agent of my own branch of my own uh, franchise, of my own venue, but I can't make contracts on behalf of Starbucks in general. If I make a contract with a coffee bean farm in, in Columbia uh, to supply Starbucks in general with 100 tons of coffee beans per month, well, I may be liable for that, but Starbucks, the main Starbucks headquarters in Seattle is not liable for that because I don't have the authority to speak on behalf of the franchise. And the same thing is true with the contracts or torts that I commit. If I, if my store, if I'm negligent and somebody ends up with a, uh, with a jagged piece of metal in their coffee and files a lawsuit against me, well, of course they can sue me, they can sue my franchise, but they cannot sue the parent company. They cannot sue Starbucks in general because I am not an agent of the of the Starbucks name. I am simply a franchise that has the right to market under their logo. Of course, each one of them, franchisors and franchisees, are liable for their own torts and their own contracts, but not necessarily of each other. Of course, I'm not liable for Starbucks's torts. If Starbucks gets sued for false advertising or something for putting on commercials on the radio that were inaccurate, well then just because I have a franchise doesn't mean that I'm personally liable. Neither of us are liable for the torts, the damages caused by the other. Licensing is really an element of franchising. Licensing in general is a business arrangement that occurs where the owner of an intellectual property, very often a trademark or a patent, could even be a copyright, contracts to permit another party to use that intellectual property. 
you can see why it's relevant to franchising, because if I have a Starbucks, I have the right to use the, all the intellectual property that goes along with that. Uh, other types of agreements might be where I have the right to manufacture something with a patented process because I made an agreement, a licensing agreement, with the owner of the patent, with the person who filed for and secured the patent. That would be a licensing agreement. Another type of similar business arrangement is a joint venture. A joint venture is simply where two or more businesses combined combine to pursue a single project or transaction. Now, for purposes of everything we've discussed so far in these courses, they're really considered partners. They have fiduciary duties to, to each other. They have to manage the business together. They're joint and severally liable. One example, I think AT&T and... Bell South, I think it was, back, I don't know, 10, 15 years ago, uh, combined and formed a joint venture called Singular Wireless LLC. Now, now I think it's no such thing. Now I think uh, Singular Wireless might have become AT&T Mobility or something. I forget offhand. But the point is that they, two big companies, AT&T and Bell South, were two major companies, and they got together to try to join the, join the cell phone market, join the wireless market, and that was a joint venture, where they're not really becoming a single company, but they're working together on a particular project based on some sort of agreement. And a joint venture, as we discussed before, operates as a partnership. Each joint, each joint venturer, Bell South and, and uh, AT&T, in the example I just gave, is considered a partner. And therefore, they're each liable for the debts and operations of the joint venture partnership, just like any other partnership. Just like we discussed before, when you're talking about a general partnership, each partner is liable. When you're talking about a joint venture, the same thing applies. Something that is not quite a joint venture, and certainly not a franchise agreement, is something that is called a strategic alliance. A strategic alliance is an arrangement between two or more companies in the same industry to achieve a particular obje objective. Again, it's not that they're forming a partnership or doing anything together specifically, they're just agreeing to work together on some particular facet.